On June 2nd in 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Committee issued 94 calls to action. The calls are to governments, churches, and all Canadians to reset the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. 42 calls to action are titled Legacy. They deal with the impacts of residential schools. 52 calls to action are titled Reconciliation. They provide foundation stones for building a new just relationship. In worship, we honor God's call to seek, to encounter, and to know God. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation. We pray that God opens our hearts to the calls for reconciliation. Our Indigenous moment uh, this morning is um, about a hockey player. And uh, most of you know that uh, I really like sports. And so I, when I was looking at um, Indigenous sports figures, I came across Frederick Fred Saskamoos, or his Indigenous name is Running Deer. He is of a Cree descent. He was born in Debden, Saskatchewan on December 25th, 1933, and grew up on the Anathakahoop Indian Reserve in Saskatchewan. He was one of 11 children of whom six died from smallpox. When he was six years old, Canadian authorities forced Saskamoose and his brother into a truck and took them to a Roman Catholic run St. Michael's Indian Residential School in Duck Lake. This was one of the last schools to close in Canada in 1996. It was at this school that running deer learned how to play ice hockey. He was one of the first Canadian Indigenous players in the National Hockey League and the first First Nations player with treaty status. Treaty status is detailed in the Indian Act passed by Parliament in 1876. He played 11 games with the Chicago Blackhawks during the 1953-1954 season. Didn't score any points for the rest of his NHL career. But uh, his career in hockey lasted from 1954 to 1960 and was spent with various minor, uh, minor leagues. In 1944, at age 11, Saskamoose joined the Duck Lake ice hockey team. He's, his skills were first recognized by a priest in Montreal who became the sports director at the Indian Residential School Saskamoose was attending. The priest pushed Saskamoose to improve himself, and he went on to develop an extraordinary left-handed shot. Saskamoose had troubled time at school. When he was nine, he was raped by fellow students and told of other punishments by school officials. While well, Saskamoose became one of the star players on the school's team, he left Duck Lake at the age of 15 and so feared returning to the school that he didn't believe at first when the priest had a hockey scout visit his home. Ultimately, Saskamoose did meet the scout and at age 16 joined the Junior Moose Jaw Canucks who played in the Western Junior Hockey League. After scoring 31 goals during the 1953-54 season, he was named the league's most valuable player. And during the season, he made his NHL debut with the Chicago Blackhawks playing November 20th, 1953 against the, oh, this team, the Boston Bruins. Saskamoose played two games with, the Chicago, with Chicago at the time before being sent back to junior. He was called up again to play for the Hawks a few months later after Moose Jaw's season ended in February, 1954. After his playing career, Saskamoose became a band counselor of the Athakoop Cree Nation, serving for 35 years and spent one term, six years, as chief. He was also extensively involved in the development of sports programs for Indigenous children. Starting in 1961, he used his fame to promote opportunities for youth sports, which included ice hockey, long distance running, track and field, soccer, 
and basketball. In 2002, he was honored by the Blackhawks at a home game. He was introduced into the Saskatchewan Sports Hall of Fame in the Builders category in 2007. He was also inducted into the Prince Albert Sports Hall of Fame, Meadow Lake Wall of Fame, the Federation of Saskatchewan Indian Nations, or the FSIN, a circle of honor, and the Canadian Native Hockey Hall of Fame. He was acknowledged for his achievements and contributions by both the Assembly of First Nations and the FSIN. He was also a founding member of the Northern Indian Hockey League. He became a member of the Order of Canada in 2018. Saskamoose was admitted to hospital in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, where he was diagnosed with COVID-19 on November 20th, 2020. He died four days later due to complications from the virus. He was buried at the Athakoop First Nation Cemetery in Athakoop, Saskatchewan. He married Loretta Isbister in 1955. They had nine children. At the time of his death, Saskamoose's memoir, Call Me Indian, was being finished and had scheduled release date of September the 13th, 2022. And I am looking forward to reading it. And you can see some of the pictures on the screen there, uh, him playing for the Blackhawks, him having an introduction to uh, an NHL heritage game on, the, uh, on the, the right, or I guess it would be on your left of the screen. And then in the middle uh, is his book, Call Me Indian, which again, will be coming out uh, in September of, of this year. Thank you. Please join me in our call to worship. We gather because we are God's people. Day by day, Sunday by Sunday, we praise the living God. We are a community in Christ Jesus, in praise, in prayer, in teaching, fellowship, and reconciliation. We are sustained by our Lord. Let us worship God. Here's our prayer of adoration and confession. God of all peoples, in all times and places, your creation sings your praise. Your son teaches us the ways of love, justice, and peace. Your spirit embodens our hearts and hands to build the world according to your will. We confess our brokenness. We do not hear the cries of those who are suffering because it is inconvenient and constantly to respond. We do not acknowledge truths that make us uncomfortable. We reject and belittle those who are different than we are. We are blind to the ways we benefit today from a legacy of hurt against indigenous peoples. Too often we love imperfectly, speak harshly and judge quickly. We pray for healing for indigenous families and communities, both within and outside the church who are struggling with intergenerational trauma from residential schools and other forms of violence. Guide our church and congregations in ways that uphold indigenous rights and reject anti-indigenous racism. Reconciling God, we are called to gentleness, to compassion, to radical acceptance of difference. In Christ Jesus, we are learning to walk in new ways with new compassions. We are learning to surrender the need to justify, to explain, and to fix. We are learning to listen. When creation groans, we groan as well. When your people speak out against injustice, we honor their courage and stand with them. Spirit of God, create in us feeling hearts, clear eyes, and open minds through Jesus Christ. Amen. The prayer for illumination. As your word is read, O Lord, by your spirit, open our hearts to hear your message in new ways. Amen. So our reading this morning is uh, taken from uh, Matthew 5, verses 21 to 24. And I will be reading it from the uh, First Nations Version, an Indigenous translation of the New Testament. Respect toward all. 
You have heard that our ancestors were told long ago, do not take another person's life. And whoever does will have to answer to the tribal council. But I tell you, everyone who is angry toward a fellow human being will have to answer to the tribal council. If they speak with disrespect to somebody saying, you hollow head, they will also face the tribal council. If they curse someone by saying, you damn fool, they may end up in the valley of the smoldering fire. So if you are offering a gift at the creator's ceremonial lodge, and there, remember, a tribal member has something against you, leave your gift and make things right. Then you can come back and finish the ceremony. So today's um, devotional or reflection is taken from the Christian Reformed Church of, of Canada. And uh, it's by the uh, Reverend uh, Daniel Brown. So the, uh, the picture that you see on the screen is called Defend the Truth. It tells us to always keep your word and defend the truth at all times. Learn to speak the truth in love. Lies will twist your heart and gossip will pervert your mind. To know the truth, learn the creator's teachings and the truth will set you free. The painting is the 10th of 12 paintings in a series entitled Steps Along the Red Road Following Christ the Creator. The series was painted by Cree artist Ovide Bigarty in 2006. It was commissioned by the Indian Metis Christian Fellowship to correspond to the 12 steps or teachings that guide life at the ministry. So we've heard the words reconciliation, healing, forgiveness, and peace. Words like these permeate the life of the church and are a source of tremendous comfort to us as sin breaks in our world. These are things that come from God through Christ, the reconciler, the healer, the forgiver, and the peacemaker. They come at the cost of death and resurrection. These things also come as a challenge as we follow, Christ, follow Christ's example. The word and the Holy Spirit tells us that we are to be reconcilers, reconcilers and healers and peacemakers in his name, as the scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 to 21. This is an important aspect of living is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. In our reading today, Matthew 5, 21 to 26, Christ is teaching us the importance of striving to maintain the peaceful relationships. So when we ask the question, why is reconciliation important? Reverend Brown tells us that the following, that following a sermon in which he mentioned residential schools and how important it was that we participate in the process of reconciliation, he was approached by a young man. He asked Reverend Brown, why we should pay attention to the issues of indigenous schools and government. The young man didn't mean that it was, wasn't a worthy cause, but he wanted to know what it had to do with the gospel. Reverend Brown's answer was everything. There is a hidden tragedy in Jesus' sermon that we know as the Sermon on the Mount. I guess we could say there was a whole bunch of sermons when he was doing the Sermon on the Mount, but one of them was about murder. And, and we often miss uh, when we read these verses in Matthew's gospel and question that needs answering. Where are your brothers and sisters? Does that sound familiar? 
Remember when God approached Cain and asked, where is your brother? Why is it that we have to leave everything and go find them? Shouldn't they be at the altar too? Shouldn't they be here with us? But they are not. And the church, which we are a part of, is the reason why. We seek reconciliation in the area of indigenous education, where the Church of Jesus Christ has played a long and damaging role. To Jesus, reconciliation is something that needs to be done before we worship. Without it, our relationship with God and with one another is really incomplete. There has to be a transformative change of mind and heart. We seek this change. We see this change in Peter. From the pre-Easter Peter to the post-Easter Peter, where Peter, pre-Easter Peter, you know, was kind of scared, didn't want to get really, you know, I don't know him, to, to the post-Easter Peter, where he went out. He was the foundation of the church. So we see this change. We see that because of the work of the Holy Spirit in Peter's heart and his mind. I believe that the recent apologies of Pope Francis and his visit in June and the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Walby, who was in Canada several weeks ago, are huge steps by the Roman Catholic Church and the Anglican churches towards reconciliation. And I believe that it will promote uh, this reconciliation and forgiveness on both sides. We too can be bold and have courage to defend the truth in support of our indigenous peoples as we move forward in our healing and reconciliation journey. Perhaps if you've not done so already, take some time to research the residential schools in Canada and pay attention to the role that Christians have played in this painful chapter of our history. Ask yourselves why reconciliation in the area of indigenous education is not only important, but imperative for the church to pursue. You may find that it leads back to defending the truth. Amen. Why are indigenous rights important? We are, we are called to ensure our actions and behaviors uphold the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The, the principles addressed protection from discrimination and violence, the right to health, safety, and well being and a recognition of the inherent worth of indigenous identity, spirituality, knowledge, laws, and governance. These principles are a minimum standard for the well-being of indigenous peoples. In Canada, the legacy of anti-indigenous racism has meant that indigenous peoples are more likely to experience violence, higher mortality rates, and poorer health outcomes across a wide spectrum of health-related issues including emotional, physical, spiritual, and mental health, as well as barriers to housing, education, employment, treatment, food, and economic security. While the church has apologized and confessed its role in running residential schools and rejected the doctrine of discovery, we also acknowledge that systematic racism shapes our society, which includes the church. It, only, it will only be eliminated with ongoing intentional action. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is a critical framework to guide our actions as we seek to eliminate anti-Indigenous racism. Let us pray. Creator God, you call us to justice and to right relationship with you, with each other, and with creation. We confess our policies and practices do not reflect your will and the policies Christ taught. 
As a church, we participate in we participated in policies and were shaped by doctrines and dogmas that distorted and misrepresented the good news of the gospel and that were unjust and harmful. We repent of these ways and we seek anew to live as we ought. Guide us that we might uphold justice and reconciliation in the practices that shape our lives and the policies that govern us. Strengthen the conviction that human and indigenous rights point towards the inherent dignity of all peoples. Creator God, we live and love imperfectly. You called us to love our neighbor as ourselves, but collectively we have not. And individually, we fall short. We say all people reflect your image, but our actions betray, betray what we say. For those of us living with pain or grief caused by racism or, and colonialism, we ask for your healing and strength. For those of us living with privilege and wondering what to do, we ask for the strength to learn, to listen, and to work to end systems that oppress. As you came to set captives free, free us from all of those ways of thinking, speaking and acting that belittle or harm any of your beloved creations, and show us again how to live in your love. Let us work towards reconciliation. Amen. Calls to Action 1 to 5 deal with protecting and prioritizing the needs and well being of Indigenous children. While Jordan's principle reflects a healthcare setting, a child first principle has implications across child poverty, housing, water, sanitation, food security, family violence, addictions, and educational inequalities. Prioritizing the needs and well being of children must also consider the shockingly disproportionate disproportionate number of Indigenous children removed from their homes and even communities by child and family services agencies. Fulfilling these calls to action and upholding Jordan's principle is critical for the well-being of Indigenous children in Canada. Let us pray. Creator God, you cherish all your children and call us to love and care for them also. But we confess that our ways are too often not your ways that our societies are unequal and our policies are too often wounding. As a church, we have participated in the harms of colonialization and racism with the result that generations of indigenous children have been forced from families and communities. Their needs and well-being are not prioritized. In Christ, you were always on the move in a dangerous world. And from the first night, you knew the terror of being away from your home and community. In silence, we remember and pray for children who were taken from their homes to residential schools and for their families. For children who died because of residential schools. For those who grieve the death of children. For children and their families who were caught in the cycles of violence for children and their families who do not have access to basic services necessary to be healthy, safe, and thriving. For the indigenous children who are still today being removed from their homes and communities by welfare services at disturbing and destructively high levels. For children who have felt there is no place for them in the world. Holy Spirit, stir in us dedication to the conviction, conviction that racism can be eliminated and give us the will to work for the end of inequality and injustice that harms Indigenous children. Let us work for reconciliation. Amen. Call to action number eight is one of the several calls to action related to education for First Nations children, and it remains unmet. In the words of the 2021 Calls to Action Accountability Report of the Yellowhead Institute, Calls to Action 6 to 12 address the colonial legacy of assimilative, violent, and chronologically underfunded systems of education. 
that Indigenous children and peoples experience in Canada. Meeting these calls is among the crucial steps to ensuring the well being of Indigenous children and families, both now and for the future. Let us pray. Creator God of all knowledge, wisdom, and love, you have called us to work for justice and equity wherever there is injustice. Christ taught that your reign is among us when children are loved, their needs met, and when they're placed at the center of our concern and care. As a church that ran residential schools, we participated in a system where Indigenous children were removed from their homes and communities. We know that we sinned and are complicit in creating the current system of injustice. As a church, we repent of these sins and pray for hearts renewed to live out your justice. We know that there is inequity and injustice in educational funding for Indigenous children, and we cannot be complacent. We pray that those who form our laws will correct the injustice and iniquity that Indigenous children experience that is their right to a good education is upheld and that equitable funding will become a reality. Holy Spirit, nurture in us the humility, wisdom and will to pursue right action and to advocate for change. Let us work for reconciliation, amen. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, I pray and hope that everybody kind of survived that storm that we had. Uh, I know um, my wife and I were out at our oldest son's house yesterday because they had a tree fall down onto their, onto their deck and the, and the boys were actually outside uh, just before the tree fell and they came in and then the tree fell. So we are so thankful that they were inside before that tree fell, but uh, it, it took us about an hour and a half to, to clean it all up, and, and now they can actually exit their sliding glass door and go back out onto that deck again. So, but, uh, so we just trust that everybody uh, was, uh, didn't suffer too much damage yesterday or pain. So here is our blessing and benediction. Across Canada, Presbyterians respond to the call for reconciliation. This is the healing and the reconciliation ministry of our church as we continue to understand and learn as part of our story. With Jesus, the great reconciler, we are walking toward right relationships. So let us all go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>